okay, here's the deal. In order for me to be a successful pastor, I have to be able to twist people's arms. I mean, after all, we have electrical work that needs to be done around here. We have food that needs to be taken to shut-ins. We need Sunday school teachers. We need youth workers. We are desperate for altos in our choir. And so a successful pastor has to be able to twist some arms and get people to volunteer with their time and their talents and their interests and their passions. Now, every pastor knows that there's a great little story in the Bible here that will help give people that extra nudge in order to sign up uh, their time and talents to help the church. And here's how the, here's how the story goes. It was one that Jesus told, a parable of the talents. You see, there was this master. We kind of think of him as God. There was this master who was very wealthy, and he decided that he was going to go on a long journey. So he called his servants before him, and before he left, to one servant he gave five talents, and to a second servant he gave two talents, and so forth and so on. And he expected these servants to take their talents and multiply them while he was away. So he left on his journey. He was gone for quite some time. The first servant immediately took those talents and doubled them. By the time the master came back, you see, he could not only uh, play the trumpet, he could play the oboe as well. The second servant, he doubled his talents. He could not only barbecue chicken in his backyard, but he could also fry okra on the kitchen stove by the time the master came back. Doubled his talents. The master returned. The servants came before him one by one. The first servant said, you gave me five talents, I now have ten. And the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a little, so I'm going to give you more to do. And the second servant said, I've doubled my talents. And, and the, the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Said the same thing he did to the first servant. He said to both of them, come and enter the joy of your master. So we have this great little parable of Jesus in the Bible that preachers can use and, and motivate you and inspire you to check off all these things on the time and talent sheet that we want to distribute. Ah, the church is going to be in great shape because I'm sure that you're going to want God to say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, before I hand out the time and talent sheets, in the interests of full disclosure, I must tell you that there are a few things that I left out of the parable. Um, for one thing, what I didn't just now tell you is that the master in the parable really is not so much like God. The master is hard-hearted. He's a cheater. He's a little lazy himself. He wants to earn his money off of other people's work. He's actually more like Donald Trump than he is God. I, I, I left that part out. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I also uh, forgot to tell you um, that the servants... They weren't really servants, you see, they were slaves. And I didn't want to mention that. I mean, after all, I'm trying to get you to sign your time and talent sheets and fill it out, and slavery just sounds bad. It's not politically correct. And so I thought I would romanticize it a little bit by calling them servants. But in the parable of Jesus, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, they were actually slaves there. And, uh, oh, the... Uh, I, 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 I misled you a little bit. The talents that were distributed, they weren't really skills and interests and passions and, and personality strengths and gifts and graces. Uh, the word talent comes from the Greek word talentos, and it means cold, hard cash. 
uh, it means a talent is about a million bucks. And so you see, this, this parable that Jesus told is, um, it's about money. It's not really about giving your best to the master. Uh, it's a parable, actually, I didn't tell you this. I knew some of you would be upset. It's a parable, actually, about the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And I know we're a little touchy about that uh, these days, what with all the CEO salaries in the news and so forth. Um, uh, there's another thing that I really left out when I was trying to tell you this. You see, these slaves who doubled their talents, one managed to go from five million to 10 million, the other managed to go from two million to four million. What I didn't tell you is the only way that it's possible to do that in the New Testament economic environment is by being a criminal. There is no legal, ethical way to double five million bucks or two million bucks without criminal activity. I, I, I kind of left that out because you see, um, it, was, it was a no growth economy. And the only way that you could make that huge amount of money, there were three ways actually you could make that much money, that you could double uh, that, that volume of money. You could uh, become a loan shark. You could loan money to the peasants and wait for them to have a bad year and you wouldn't have to wait too long back in those days. And then you could foreclose on their houses and their, their fields. And that was a good way to make a lot of money and all the rich people did that. Uh, another way that you could make that much money is to bribe the Roman government and get the tax contract for your district. And then you could fleece everybody that was around you and charge whatever tax rate you wanted. And you could make a lot of money if you had the tax contract from the Roman government. The other thing you could do very simply is you could hire some thugs and rob the rich caravans that happened to go through your neck of the woods. So. I failed to tell you in that initial description of the parable that the only way these two servants, these two slaves could have doubled their money would be through criminal activity. Oh yeah, I forgot also to tell you about that there was a third slave in the parable. Um, at first I didn't want to mention him. He was given one talent, which would be about a million bucks, and he took it out and he buried it. He didn't work his talent like the other two slaves did. Um, actually, I left out really the whole second half of the parable here. Um, I mean, it, it goes on to describe a confrontation between the third slave and the master, and it gets ugly. They start calling each other names, and they start making accusations and blames of, of each other. And finally, uh, well, I also didn't tell you that the parable ends with the master telling the third slave to go to hell. Uh, I left that out. I didn't think... Uh, I mean, after all, we come to church on Sunday to get away from all of that, and I, I didn't think you wanted to hear that part of it, but it, it's in there. Um, so I guess, um, I guess my question is whether I really should um, preach that amputated parable that I told you about at first, or whether I should try to preach the parable that Jesus actually told. And in order to preach, preach means share the good news with people. I have to ask myself, what, what's the good news in the actual parable that Jesus told with all the confrontation and the, the third slave being thrown into the outer darkness? And uh, what's the good news in the actual parable? Uh, I guess part of the good news would be that you don't have to fill the time and talent sheet out this morning. I, I guess that might be good news to some people. But uh, let's work on that question. What is the good news of the actual parable that Jesus told? At first glance, it is a depressing parable. It reminds us of so many problems in our society and in our lives. I mean, it starts out with the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, and that's a problem. Even those of us in the middle class are feeling pinched by that, and we all know people who are struggling with unemployment or underemployment, we all know people who are getting pinched really hard by the rich getting richer and the poor getting poor. That's in the parable, it's kind of, it's dark and it's kind of depressing. And another thing that's in the parable that we notice is this master, um, 
This master who is so cruel and so hard-hearted, we all, we all kind of know about that. Perhaps it's some place that, that we're working and we have that experience at work. Or perhaps it's somebody that we associate with day after day, maybe even somebody in our family who is controlling or who is out of control. And it's like it's a master of our lives and we can't get away from it. Or maybe the master is something that's inside of us, some anxiety that we live with all the time. Or maybe the, 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 the master is inside of ourselves and it's some addiction that we have or some obsession or some depression. And it's a master for us. And, and we feel the same darkness as this parable is describing. Um, perhaps the master for us is this insistence that we accumulate, accumulate, accumulate like the master and the first two slaves in the parable. And we know that all of this accumulation is not healthy for ourselves as individuals or for our society. Perhaps we can experience the darkness of this parable as people who sometimes cut moral corners, perhaps not egregiously so, but just enough because we think it serves the better interest of our families or our church or ourselves. And so we sort of neglect some of our values like the slaves, the first two slaves in the parable. So the question is, is there any good news in this parable? I think there is. The good news, I think, is in the third slave. If you don't see it, take a harder look with me at the third slave. The third slave actually reminds me of Jesus. In fact, the third slave has a lot more in common with Jesus than the master has with God. Now, we maybe need to get by that part of the third slave burying his treasures. Um, he did bury the million bucks. And I wanna say this about the slave burying the million bucks. In the Jewish culture of New Testament times, that's the only honorable thing a slave could do. The money wasn't his, and so he had an obligation to return it someday to the master whenever the master returned. Also, the only way the slave could have actually taken that money and done something with it in order to double it would have been to be involved in criminal activity. He did the only honorable, ethical thing that he could do. He's the only character in this whole dark parable who has any righteousness about him, any ethical standards. This is the character who illustrates what Jesus said in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are persecuted for doing what is right, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the character who's willing, like Jesus was, to pay the cost for not playing the game of the powerful. The third slave is a mentor to us. He's the one who models discernment and courage and justice and honor. When we feel overwhelmed by the way that life can be, this third slave, this third slave models for us integrity, personality, and self-respect. And most important is this. By the end of the parable, the third slave is no longer a slave. He's free. He's been cast out of the household of the Pharaoh, of the master, like the slaves of old. He too was thrown out into the night, into the wilderness, into that place where there is a weeping and gnashing of teeth, but he was willing to go because he knew that the, that the outer darkness was not the end of God's story. The present sufferings that we endure are nothing compared to the glory that is yet to be revealed. At the end of the parable, this fellow is free. This fellow knew the bigger story. This fellow had the courage to speak the truth to power. Like Jesus, who was willing to go into the outer darkness of Golgotha because that was the path to what was right and what is good in God's plan for the world. This third slave for us is the light of the story. This third slave is the hope. This third slave lives on in our spirits and our hopes today.